But really, really amazing to have you here. Um, such a privilege to be able to be up here. One of my highlights so far this morning was uh, the incredible man that was on drums. I told the story a little bit earlier. He's here with his, his wifey and their little boy. Um, but as, we, as they were finished up with, with practice this morning and they all got off the stage and, and Andrew was kind of standing at the back there. And as we started to play the music that we play for As People Arrive, I just saw Andrew get his headphones out. And just put them on and start playing his own music. He's like, I don't want to listen to this nonsense. So I apologize, Andrew. Um, but uh, we're going to get that sorted out. Don't worry. So um, if you have an issue with the music, please put it in the suggestion box. And we also need to get a suggestion box, someone. Um, but really good to, to be here this morning, having a, a lot of fun at church. Um, like I said, my name's Tyler. I'm part of the team here at Life Changes. It's a real honor and privilege to be on team, um, passionately pursuing um, and building a church that loves people and, and wants to see the gospel advance, which is really cool. Um, and I just also want to say a massive thank you to the elders and to the leaders of this community for giving me the opportunity to preach in a series like this. This is a, um, it's a big series for us. We are, we are putting stakes in the ground. And so for a young man to be able to stand up here and preach, um, it's incredibly um, humbling. Um, and it's a real, real honor. So Mark, all the way in Doha, thank you. If you can hear that, um, and thank you for the t to the team. Really, really is a great privilege. I'm going to pray for us, and then we're going to get stuck in. Is that all right? Father, I thank you that this morning as we hear your word, as we engage in your word, Father God, I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would work in our hearts, Jesus. I pray this morning that our ears would not simply be tickled by a sermon, God, but that our hearts would be changed, Father. Thank you for each and every person in this room that is on a journey or going on a journey, Holy Spirit. I pray that you would work in their hearts, Father, so that when we leave this place this morning, you have transformed us, Jesus. We thank you that when your word is preached, the Bible promises us that there will be transformation and power. And so we pray for that this morning, Holy Spirit. And I pray, Jesus, that you would soften the hearts of each and every person in this room, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. In Genesis 1, 27 to 28, it says this, So God created mankind in His own image. In the image of God, He created them. Male and female, He created them. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. I'm going to read verse 27 again. So God created mankind in His own image. In the image of God, He created them. Male and female, He created them. I want to say to you this morning that humanity was made in the image of God. There are these two verses at the end of chapter 1 of Genesis. It's the first book of the Bible. It is the account of creation. And there is a chapter that tells the story of the entire universe being created. God speaks and the stars are put in place. If you haven't read it, it's a great chapter of the Bible to read. God puts the heavens and the earth in place. He, he lifts up the mountains. He lowers the valleys. He puts water onto the earth. He, he creates the plants and the animals and all of that thing. And, but then there's this incredible thing. At the end of, of, of chapter 1, he speaks of creating humanity. But then the Bible allocates a whole other chapter to telling the story of creating humanity us, creating mankind. And, and the reason I believe that that is in chapter 2 is because there is an emphasis on the creation of mankind. There is an emphasis that God is placing on our creation saying that actually you were designed in my image. You are image bearers of God. There is a relationship with us and God that is unique. There is no other creation that has that same relationship and I believe this this morning, and I truly believe this, that when God created man, when he breathed his life into mankind, he created a blueprint for humanity. He created a, a sort of image that was the perfect design for mankind. And, and, and when we read that, we realize that actually what we are trying to do and what Jesus was doing when he came on the cross was he was returning humanity to that original design. And in Genesis 3, we read the, the account of the fall. We read the account of, of, of God giving Adam and Eve, giving humanity dominion over the earth. And then he says to Adam and Eve, actually, there is one thing you may not do. You may not eat of the fruit of knowledge. You may not eat of the fruit of good and evil. Everything else you have dominion over. You, and basically what God was saying when he said, have dominion, subdue it. He was saying, make it great. He was saying, actually, this world that you live in, your job is to make it phenomenal. I'm giving it to you as a gift. And he gave one instruction not to, to give it. You know, God wasn't trying to catch Adam and Eve out. 
He was putting a boundary line in place that was necessary for them to thrive. He said, do not eat of that fruit. Because that fruit is mine. It is who I am. I am called to rule over you. And in a moment, through the lies of a serpent, Adam and Eve decided that they wanted to rule over themselves. And sin entered the world. Brokenness entered the world. A separation from God entered the world. And with a separation from God comes a separation from goodness comes a separation from God's original design, His blueprint, the image which He designed for us. And what we did is we traded the image of God for a counterfeit image. We traded the image of God for an image that brings death, not life. Because outside of God, outside of His design, there is death. And so what we end up with is in the area of sexuality specifically, humanity traded the image of God for a man-made image. An image that fundamentally, when you go on the journey of that image, it leads to death and destruction. But because of Jesus, we are able to step into wholeness again. Because of Jesus, we are able to step back into the image of God. But the reality is we need to deal with some of our earthly perspectives. Because no matter what you say or how you say it, we all have a perspective. We live in a world of Twitter and Instagram and Facebook where everybody's giving you their opinion. They don't care if you want it or not. I've been told why I should be banting, why I should be vegan, why I should be everything in one day on one Facebook scroll. Everybody's got an opinion on things. But I want to say to you that as the church, we need to get God's opinion. We need to get heaven's perspective. Because heaven's perspective is the only perspective that leads to life. And I want each and every one of us, myself included, to walk into the life that comes with living in the image of God. And so this morning, and as we've been doing this over the last three weeks, as we've engaged on the series of Sex on Sundays, what we are doing is saying we want to learn and go back to the original design of sexuality that God placed on mankind. We want to step back into that space. Mark challenged us with a statement. He said, the world wants us to be stingy with our money and generous with our sexuality, but God's design is for us to be generous with our money and stingy with our sexuality. The two things that will either catapult us into an incredible future or actually rob us of a future is our understanding of God in the areas of sex and money. When we understand God's image for them, we walk into the future that He's got for us. And so this morning as we engage, I want to say that the good news for you and me is because of Jesus, we can walk in life, freedom, and wholeness in both of those areas, specifically in the area of sexuality. We can walk in freedom, not because of us, not because of clever um, books or counseling or magazines. We can walk in freedom because of Jesus. And so this morning I would ask as we engage the Word I would ask that you say, you almost ask Jesus, even in this moment now, Father, would you come and work in my heart? Because we all have a perspective. And so this morning, what I'm going to spend a few minutes doing is I actually want to share a little bit of my story as a young man around um, some brokenness that entered my world. Um, And as I share the story, I I share it not because I want uh, sympathy, not because of any of that. The reason I share it is because I want to display a little bit of what God's redemption looks like in somebody's life. I want to display a little bit of that. So please bear with me as I share. I'm going to be stuck to my notes a little bit just so I don't miss anything. But uh, I was born in the incredible metropolis of Springs in Johannesburg, the beautiful East Rand. It's magnificent. There are jacaranda trees for three weeks of the year. Um, it's a beautiful place in Springs, and um, my, my mom fell pregnant with me. My mom and dad were, um, started dating. My mom fell pregnant with me, and they decided to get married because um, she fell pregnant with me, which seemingly was the right thing to do. Um, they got married, and I, I started an amazing life. My parents uh, looked after me exceedingly well. We had everything we could have dream- I could have dreamed of. I got a four-wheeler when I was six. It was, I was living the life. I didn't know how to ride it, but I was living the life. Um, and, and so it just had an incredible uh, childhood in that perspective. And, and we lived very close to a, a group of our family. And, and so we would often go to our family members for lunch and brides, as one does. Um, and when I was around six or seven years old, I can't remember the specific dates, one of my um, family members, who was about 14 at the time, introduced me to pornography. 
um, and he started uh, it, uh, almost watching pornography with me, and, 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 and he entered me into this world at a very, very young age, very confused, didn't really know what was going on. And that engagement with pornography over time um, became uh, him, um, unhelp, uh, sexual acts that were, he was performing, and, and there was all of this happening. He started to molest me over a period of time, um, which was a very tough, and, and I didn't really know what was going on. He would often say to me, actually, if you tell anybody about this, you're going to ruin the family. You're going to do all of these things, which is absolute nonsense. Um, and, and he started this journey, and, and it culminated over a, a period of time of it getting progressively um, bigger and more intense and more intense. And I want to say to you that, that sin never ends where you start. Um, and so when we start engaging in things that are not of God, actually, they always progressively get worse. And, and he was a, a, a broken guy, and so he started doing this, and it culminated in, in um, him raping me quite a few times which was quite, a, it was big, I was very young, I was very small, um, and it was this big thing that I had to deal with, and, and eventually, uh, because a lady came and spoke at our school, after months and months of this happening, and, and not knowing how to deal with it, and bear with me, I'm, I'm going to land in a space, but, but not knowing how to deal with this, a lady came and spoke at our school, and she shared about a similar thing that had happened to her, and, and I acquired the courage to be able to, to tell somebody. And so I, I spoke to a teacher and inadvertently spoke to, to my parents and I, I, I spoke to them. And I thank God that my mom and my dad, particularly my mom, handled it exceptionally well. They believed me outright. They, my mom took me to a t child psychologist immediately. Um, they started the journey. I, I thank God that they handled it exceedingly well because I know for many people it's not handled well. Um, however, even though I received the necessary help that I required, there was still a brokenness that came with it. Um, a year or two after that, like I said, I'm not great with names. Uh, my mom and, and dad got divorced um, because of an incredibly unhealthy marriage. Um, and, and so that was also big for me. My, as, as you know, your parents, when you're growing up, are kind of the unit that you look to for everything. And they are the perfect kind of example of everything. And, and a very unhealthy marriage ended up in a divorce, which actually was probably the best decision because it really wasn't great. But the reality was... Through that thing that had happened with that family member and through my parents' divorce, I entered life with a very broken view of my sexuality. I entered life with a very low bar for sexuality. I, I placed very little worth on my sexuality because actually it had been taken from me so easily. And, uh, and it had been taken from me at a time where I did not understand it. And so therefore, I placed an intrinsic lack of value on it. Um, I entered a... Uh, I do want to say, even though um, I know that for many of you, you might be sitting in this room going, well, actually, that didn't happen to me. I don't know how that happened. Uh, I don't have a similar experience. But I want to say to you that all of us have things that have happened in our world that are identity defining. All of us have had engagements with people and moments in our lives and things that have happened, whether it be at two years old, 10 years old, 20 years old, or 50 years old. There are things that happen to us that are identity defining. And so as I share this story, these were identity-defining things for me. However, yours may be different, but what I'm going to speak about, the redemption in Christ works the same way. My own sexuality was cheap in my eyes. It had been taken from me. I knew about things that I, someone my age should never have known. I, as I hit my teenage years and started discovering my sexuality, I, I struggled to understand how it all worked. I knew way more than I should have, but I knew it all in a very unhealthy way. Um, and so I started to outwork my sexuality in sin. I got addicted to pornography because it had been introduced to me at such a young age. I, I had distorted views of sexuality. Um, and, and so this thing started to progress in my life. I entered my teenage years with a very broken view of marriage. Because my parents' marriage hadn't worked, I thought marriage didn't work. And so I assumed, well, actually, that doesn't work. And, and now I'm not saying that, that, that marriage is everybody's landing space. But actually, for a large majority of the room, you will get married, and it is important to have a good biblical God view of marriage. But I entered life with a very broken view of marriage. Um, and so what ended up happening is I actually blocked out in my memory all of that that had happened. All of the tough moments, I, I blocked out everything that that person had done to me. Um, I blocked out um, much of the tough times in my growing up around my mom and dad. I blocked that stuff out, and, and because of, of, of um, some alcohol abuse and a whole bunch of things, it was, a, like I said, an unhealthy marriage, and I blocked all of these memories out. And I want to say that even though all of that happened this morning, I want to say to you, but God. 
I want to say, but God. And actually, if He is the image bearer and the image creator, then He is the only one that can restore us to that. And so this morning, I really want to emphasize that, but God. And when I was 16 years old, I went to a youth ministry where a man um, was preaching Jesus and passionately loved Jesus, and I gave my life to God. And all of a sudden, everything changed. Everything changed. I, I, the, the life entered me again. I didn't understand everything. I didn't get everything. But all of a sudden, there was life, and there was freedom, and there was grace. And I was like, wow, there is more. Wow, I can step into a space of goodness and life. And, and I was introduced to the Savior named Jesus. And for some strange reason, for a short time after I committed my life to God, I started to remember the things that had happened to me. I had, I had blocked them out so deeply in my memory that I could not remember them. But for some strange reason, all of a sudden, I started to remember. And started to remember quite specifically what had happened. And I didn't understand why. I was confused. I was like, God, why are you reminding me of these things? Surely this is in the past. Surely this is gone. And I felt God say this to me. I felt Him say, you need to deal with these things. You need to deal with these things. And in that moment, I had a decision to make. I had a decision to either obey God and trust Him that He would bring healing and wholeness, or alternatively, I could have run away and kept those things locked up and never dealt with them. And the sad reality is that many of us live in that space. But I want to say to you this morning that actually your future is determined by the decisions you make now. So many young people live with a perspective of one day when, but actually, the decisions we make now will determine our one day when. People who are in older phases of life, who have had a lot of life happen to them, well, they look, behind, uh, they look back and they go, well, how can I possibly have a future if so much has gone wrong? But I want to say to you this morning that Jesus has got a future for you. And the decisions you make now will determine what that looks like. Our futures as believers in Christ, our future is now. And so this, I had a decision to make. I had a choice to go, well, actually, am I going to allow my pain to become my prison? Or am I going to allow God to use that pain to take me into the palace that He has for me? And so many of us live with our pain and we go, that is my prison. And I must bear the prison and I must bear the pain. I want to say to you, no, Jesus wants to bring healing. Jesus wants to bring wholeness. Jesus wants to bring freedom. And, and so this morning, what I'd love to share is three key things that helped me on a journey to wholeness and freedom in my sexuality and in the area of sexuality. No matter how broken your past is, God has got a great and whole future for you. I know there are people in this room who have experienced far worse things than I did. And I know there are people in this room who potentially don't understand at all what I went through. But all of us have a measure of brokenness in our past. And no matter how broken your past may be, God has got a future for you if you will allow Him to work. And so three key things that I'd like to share this morning. The first one is forgiveness. God helped me to forgive. And in Ephesians 4, 31 to 32, it says this, which I think is so profound. It says, get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ, God forgave you. You see, I had to go on a journey of forgiving the person who had wronged me. And for so many people, the illusion of forgiveness is forgetting. And I want to say to you, according to the Word of God, forgiving someone does not mean to forget what they did, or to try and push it under the carpet so that I never have to think about it again. The unfortunate reality is that so many of us process forgiveness like that. We process it as this thing that we must just put, put what happened under the carpet. If I don't think about it, it didn't happen. But actually, the Bible calls us to go on a journey of forgiveness. You know, when Jesus made the statement in the, the Sermon on the Mount, He said, forgive 70 times 7. He wasn't giving you a number at which to stop forgiving. You know, He wasn't going, okay, I've forgiven you 1, 2, 3, 4. And once I get to 140, then I can stop. No, what he was saying is forgive always. Because actually Jesus forgave us. The Bible says because you have been forgiven much, forgive much. And so actually God calls us on a journey of forgiving. And forgiveness is choosing in your heart to let go of what happened to you. It's choosing in your heart to have the hurt and the pain that that person inflicted onto you released from your heart. Because actually forgiveness is a heart issue. 
And when we forgive someone, we are releasing them. We are saying, actually, you no longer do I have that in my heart, that malice, that hatred, that anger. I release you of that. And you know, so many of us live with this understanding that actually, and, and it is a reality, but so many of us live with unforgiveness. But unforgiveness is fundamentally t- drinking poison and hoping the other person gets sick. We live with this deep seated hatred and anger in us, and we think it's hurting the other person when actually it is destroying us inside. I had to go on a journey of forgiveness. It's not simply forgetting, it is choosing to release that person. Four or five years ago, I went up to visit my dad in Johannesburg, and, um, and I saw the person who did that stuff to me in a shopping center. I saw him. We were, we were at a spa, and, and, I, I look, and I saw, and, and, and you know, in that moment, it's, that's when the rubber hits the road, because it's all good and well having a theory about it, but when you look the person in the eye who seven or eight years ago or 10 years ago, for all intents and purposes, ruined you, it's got to get real. The rubber has to hit the road, and I distinctly remember looking at him and breathing in, and there was no malice, there was no anger, there was no hatred. I actually walked up to him and said, hello, because God had dealt with it. And actually, I could step into that space, and there there was nothing left. And you know who felt free in that moment? I did, because I knew that God had given me freedom. But so many of us have got closets full of things that people have done to us that we are harboring. And the only people that are still in chains are you and I. And actually God is calling us to the biblical mandate of forgiveness. Because we want freedom in this area. I believe that Jesus sets a very high standard in this area. Because he wants to show the world a church that is a city on a hill. You know, we are called to set an incredible example, guys. Because when people look at us, they, they should see freedom. And not that that is a, it's not that uh, I'm saying that overnight you get free and then everyone's like, wow, you're so free. No, actually God takes you on a journey, but the church is called to be a city on a hill. And what that imagery means is it's called to be a people who everybody in the world can look at and see something of the goodness and kindness and freedom of God. But if we are not willing to engage with these things, the tough things, we won't walk into that space. Number one, he led me to forgive. Number two, he restored that which was broken. There's a, in um, 1 Thessalonians, I love the scripture, and I'm reading it from the message version just because I love the way it puts it. It says, may God himself, the God who makes everything holy and whole, make you holy and whole. Put you together, spirit, soul, and body, and keep you fit for the coming of our master, Jesus Christ. The one who called you is completely dependable. If he said it, he'll do it. If he said it, he'll do it. The gospel of Jesus does not only allow us the privilege of entering heaven one day when we die. The gospel of Jesus allows heaven to enter earth. It allows the principles in the life of heaven to enter our sexuality, to bring freedom, to bring life, to readjust. When uh, when the Bible speaks about um, Jesus coming down, it says that there was a ladder between heaven and earth. The reason for that is actually so that the glory of God could come down to earth and bring freedom and life. And so this morning, I want to say that Jesus did two things. He restored my view of sexuality. He restored the value of my sexuality in my own life. Because you know that you are worth way more than you think. The God of heaven and earth says that you are worth way more than you think. And because of our sinful disposition and because of the lies of the enemy, we often walk in brokenness and we never learn how much value God places on us. How much value God places on your sexuality. God restored my view of sex. It it was no longer this dirty secret that I wasn't allowed to speak about, but it was a good gift given by God that at the right time would flourish and in the right space would be incredible. He restored my view of sex and he restored my view of marriage. You see, because I had engaged with a marriage that didn't work, so I assumed that marriage didn't work. But because of the goodness of God... Because the reality is no matter how well your parents try and do it, they are flawed. But God is not. And so when we allow Him to give us our perspective, we walk in life in those areas. 
So you might be sitting here this morning and going, well, actually, marriage is a dead institution. No, I want to say to you this morning that marriage is a gift from God, a gift that is designed at the right time for you, and it is a beautiful thing. And you might be sitting here this morning and go, well, Tyler, that's all good and well. I really want to get restored. Well, how do I do that? I want to say to you, firstly, engage the Word of God. Engage the Word of God. Read the Word of God. You might read the Word for hours and hours and hours and get nothing out of it. I want to say to you that the Spirit of God is working when you are doing that. I remember I was reading the book of Galatians one day, just reading through it, kind of line by line, nothing particularly profound. I wasn't drawing on the walls all of the revelations that I was receiving in that moment. No, I was just reading, and I got to Galatians 2.20, and I read a scripture, and it's this incredible scripture that says, it's not I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And boom, God brought freedom. There was this, okay, so it's, it's not me. It's not dependent on me. It's Jesus in me. And then it goes on. It says, this life I live, I live by faith in the Son of God. Oh, okay, wow, God. When we engage the Word... He brings freedom. And you know, I love the analogy that uh, George Giorgio from PE said. He said, Sunday's like a petrol station. You get a little top up, you get encouraged, you get a bit of a view of, of who God is, but then you've got to go out in the week and you've got to drive your car and you've got to engage God and love people. And, and actually the way we get restored is to engage the word of God. So many of us wait for this profound word from heaven. I love Wally Gersmeyer made this statement once. He said, if you want to hear the audible voice of God, Read your Bible aloud. It's this, it's, and, it's, and so for many of us, like, oh, that's a trite comment. But actually, it's true. We've got a book full of it. Um, number two, walk in community. You know, when I, when I had to engage this stuff, I, I was able to lean into community. I was able to go to people and say, well, actually, you know what? I'm struggling with an addiction in pornography. Can you help me? And people were able to walk with me. And when I stumbled, people walked with me. And when you stumble and when you fall and when you miss it and when you don't understand, community rallies around you. But so many of us try to walk into the purpose and plan of God without the community of God. And they are completely and totally linked. If you want to walk in life and freedom in your sexuality, get stuck into community. Where did I learn that marriage was a good thing? In community. Where did I learn that sexuality was a good thing? In community. Get stuck into community. And then lastly, I had encounters with God. I created moments to encounter Jesus. I would come sit here on a Sunday evening. I'd come um, school the next day, come here at 6 o'clock, got to get home by half past 7. But I would sit here and worship, and I would distinctly remember the carpets were much browner at that stage. And, and I would sit there in the co- corner on my knees, and I would worship God, and I would weep, and I would feel Him stripping things off me. And I want to say to you this morning, no matter how hard you try, The only one who can bring restoration in any area, and particularly in the area of sexuality, is Jesus. You can look in every other area. It is only encounters with the King of Kings that will bring you into freedom. It's only encounters with Jesus. When we look at the accounts of Genesis, it tells the story of how the earth was void, how the earth was dark. And God spoke, and light entered, and the heavens poured out, and there was, there was light, and there was um, uh, life, and the mountains were created, and the rivers were created, and, and the animals were created. But I love how it starts. It says, the earth was void and without form. It says there was this darkness. And maybe for many of you, you're sitting here this morning, and you're going, actually, in this area, I feel dark. It, feels like, it just feels like a void. I want to say to you that the God of heaven and earth specializes in taking darkness and turning it into light. He specializes in it. And so this morning, if you are willing to open up your heart to Jesus, you'll walk into that freedom. Number one, he taught me to forgive. Number two, he restored that which was broken. And finally, he taught me how to trust again. And trust is a tough thing, and and it's a hard thing to grasp. And and I read the scripture in the Psalms a long time ago, and it's, it's so beautiful, and it's one of my favorite scriptures. It says, Lord, you alone are my portion and my cup. You make my lot secure. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Surely I have a delightful inheritance. You see, the reality is I had to learn to trust that God had a portion for me. And so many of us, are we desire a portion and we have this thing in mind, but actually we forget that it is God, it is Jesus that holds our portion secure. 
It is Jesus who holds our future secure. And actually, we have to learn to trust Him again. I love that line. It says, I have a delightful inheritance. God does not have an average inheritance for you. He has a delightful inheritance. But firstly, we need to learn to trust that He has a portion and a cup for us. That we do not have to manufacture our portion and our cup. That He has it pre-planned for us. And trusting God means two things. Number one, you have to trust God for a future. For many of us, we go, well, I don't know, do I even have a future? What is the point of me carrying on? So many of us live in that space, but actually, we have to trust that God has a portion for us, that He has a cup for us, and that He holds it secure. We have to step into a space that, that where we know that what God has got for us in any area is better than what we have for ourselves. Because you know humans are plan makers. If you read the accounts of Genesis, it's so beautiful. The moment they ate the fruit, they became aware that they were naked. And what's the first thing they do? They sew fig leaves together. We are so good at making a plan. We are so good at making a plan. Can you imagine Adam and Eve? They're like, we're naked. We need a game plan. And just ran, fig leaves, sew them together. We are so good at creating plans to get what we want instead of trusting God to give us the portion that He has designed for us. We have to trust Him for a future, and then we have to trust Him with that future, that actually He will bring it to fruition. Um, Gabe, in a, in a sermon a, a quite a few months ago, he made this statement. He said, do not steal from your future. And that is so prevalent in the area of sexuality, because God designed sex to be pleasurable for humanity. He actually gave it to us. He said, be fruitful and multiply. But then he puts this text in. He says, the boundary lines of the Lord fall in pleasant places. And so what God does is he puts boundary lines in place so that we can enjoy the gifts that he has given to us. But the challenge for you and I is that we need to trust him that in his boundary lines there will be life. But so many of us try and grab into the future and pull it forward. But actually, who knows that before you get to the promise, there's a process. And God prepares you for the promise in the process. You know, if I had gotten married at 20 years old, it would have been terrible. Now, some of you might get married at 20 years old. But if I had gotten married at 20 years old, my wife would have a really tough time. She's perfect. I would have been the problem. But the challenge is, and the reality is that God had a process for me. I had to deal with some things so that I didn't enter my marriage with those things. I had to learn some things so that I could love my wife well. And we are growing at this and getting better at it all the time. But actually, when we shortchange the process, we shortchange the promise. And we never live in the fullness that God has got in that area. I want to say to you, sometimes the process is difficult. I received a prophetic word from someone three years ago as a, a pastor in Durban. He said to me, Tyler, I know prophetic words are supposed to be encouraging. That's how he started. And he said, actually, you're going to go through a very tough season, but God is going to bring you out the other side with so much more than what you thought. And actually, I had to go through a tough season, but on the other side, there was the life of God. Sometimes it's not going to be easy, but the Bible promises us that God is good. Trusting God means I choose His ways, not my ways, because I know and believe they are better and will have greater fruit. Your future is determined by the big decisions you make now. And so this morning, I want to ask you, what stage of life are you in? Are you married? Are you single? Are you divorced? Are you dating? Are you engaged? What phase of life are you in? Actually, God has got a purpose with each and every one of those phases. The Bible says that He will take, He will turn all things for the good of those who love Him. But I believe that to walk into that goodness, we have to submit ourselves to Jesus. We have to go, God, will you come and work in me? Actually, I will obey your word and I will go on the journey of forgiveness. I will obey your word and I will let you do the work of restoration in me. What is your trust step, sir or ma'am? Because every one of us have got one. We so quickly step away from sermons and church meetings and books we read and conversations we have. And we go, wow, that's good. That's really good. And then we carry on with our lives. But we have to ask ourselves, well, what is the trust step? What is the step we need to take toward God? Maybe your trust step this week is sharing with somebody what has happened to you in your past 
and praying together for healing. Maybe your trust step is actually opening up about an area of sin that you want to see freedom come. As Gabe said, confession breaks the obsession. Maybe your trust step is actually making a decision in your relationship now not to have sex before you get married because you know that the boundary lines of God fall in pleasant places and He designed that for marriage. Maybe your trust step is actually just deciding to forgive somebody. Maybe it's a phone call you need to make. But you know, when we take steps of faith, and I'm going to go back to that scripture in Thessalonians, it says, the one who called you is completely dependable. If he said it, he will do it. We can depend on God. The Bible says that when we are faithless, he is faithful. How much more when we are faithful, will he be faithful? God has got freedom and life for us in the area of sexuality. He has got freedom and life for in the brokenness that we have experienced because He has got a future for us. God wants to, you to live in the incredible blessing that He has for you. But sometimes we've got to go through the process, which is tough and it's difficult and it doesn't always go the way we plan. But God's got something incredible for each and every one of us. Can I pray for us? Can I ask you to stand? Even in this moment, just close your eyes. It's a moment with you and God. Father, this morning I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would work in hearts, Jesus. I pray, Spirit of God, that you would start to to open up wells that have been blocked up by years and years of hurt, Father. I pray you would start to open those things up and start to deal with them in this moment, Father. I thank you for people in this room, Jesus, right now who need to extend forgiveness to someone. I pray that you would give them the courage and faith to make that decision. I pray, Spirit of God, that you would work deep in our hearts right now, Father. I thank you, Dad, where hearts have become hard. I pray that you would help people to soften them so that you can work in them, Jesus. I thank you, Father, that actually as we go about our week, that you would start to bring freedom in areas, God. Even as we step into the next few months, Father, I pray that you would start to take us into freedom, Jesus. And then, God, I pray specifically for people who have been abused in this room right now, Jesus. I pray that you would put your healing hand on them, Father. That you would wrap your arms around them in this moment, Father, and start to bring healing and restoration, Jesus. That they may walk into the divine future that you have for them, God. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you have so much more to do in each and every one of us, God. And so, Father, I pray where where we have the illusion of thinking that we are finished products, I pray, God, that you would remind us that you are the master potter and you are molding us, Jesus. You are shaping us for your glory, God. And so, Dad, this morning, I pray that you would start and you would continue to do a good work in us until you bring it to completion like your word promises, Father. In your incredible name, Jesus. Amen.